Okay, so in today's session, we're going to look at word class. And word class is very important because they help us to analyze texts um, and help us to understand why writers use specific words. But they're also really important for um, ensuring our writing is accurate because if we know the word class, we can proofread our work and make sure that we're using words correctly in sentences. And word class is often overlooked, but basically they are the foundation of sentence structures because the words are the basic units that you put together to make a sentence, to make a complete idea. So it's really important that we understand word class. Now, let's reverse engineer our learning objectives from today. So from the session, you will learn the meaning of word class, why knowing word class is important, and strategies to identify word classes in sentences. So what is word class? So all words belong to categories called word classes. There are eight word classes in English. These are nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, pronouns, conjunctions, and interjections. Now, it's vital that we know the meaning of these because it helps us then to ensure we're using the word correctly. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that words will have similarities similar behaviors or characteristics or forms. Um, another way to look at it is, for example, an analogy would be if we were to sort out your books, arrange them and organize them, well, we might arrange them into categories or we might arrange them. Um, so these categories would be, for example, their genres. So for example, you might have fiction, and then within fiction, you might have adult fiction or children's fiction. And then even within those, you might be really specific and you might have adventure, sci-fi. And the reason why we're able to identify that a book that is um, fiction, adventure or fiction, sci-fi is because of um, the characteristics of these genres. Well, the same is true for words. So, for example, nouns will have a... Um, characteristic that allows us to group them together into these categories. Now, what's important is that um, we understand that within these eight categories, there are subcategories as well, which is what we're going to go through. So, for example, nouns. First of all, we need to understand what a noun is. So, a, a noun is a word that refers to a person, place, thing, event, substance, or quality. It comes from Latin, meaning um, Latin nomen, which means name, and it generally functions as the name of a specific object or set of objects such as living creatures, places, actions, qualities, states of existence, or ideas. So that's what a noun is. Now, nouns can be broken down into proper nouns. These are names of a person, place, or organization, and they always start with a capital letter. So for example, London, United Nations, Kelly. Um, concrete nouns are a noun denoting a material object rather than something abstract, for example, tree, sunset, chair. So these are nouns that we experience with our five senses. Collective nouns refers to a group of people or things, for example, herd, crew, club, bunch. Abstract nouns, a noun denoting an idea, quality, or state rather than a concrete object, for example, pride, curious, loyalty, love, hate. And there's a test that you can use. It's what I call the box test. So for example, if I were to ask you, can you give me a box of muffins? Well, muffins then are a concrete noun because they're something that are physical. You can put it in a box. Now, if I were to ask you, can you give me a box of loyalty? Well, you couldn't, right? So that's how we can distinguish between a concrete noun and an abstract noun. Then we have verbs. Verbs are words that convey an action or state of being, also known as doing words. And um, we get different types of verbs. We have dynamic verbs and action word. They're usually um, in the continuous tense and they are actions or activities that have a definitive end. For example, grow, eat, sleep. So what that means is that they usually have a start time and a finish time. So for example, with sleep, if you're sleeping, well, you usually go to sleep at a certain time and then you'd wake up. State verbs are verbs that express a state or mental action. And they're usually not in the continuous tense. For example, prefer, understand, and own. And they usually don't have a start and stop time. Auxiliary verbs, also known as helping verbs, help the main verb to show its tense or form negation or questions. They indicate a modality such as likelihood, ability, permission, request, capacity, suggestion, order, obligation, or advice. So for example, to be can have am, is, are, was, were, being, been, will be, to have, has, have, had, having, will, have, to do, does, do, did, will do, can, could, may, might, will, would, 
shall, should, and must. So, for example, you could say, I did do it. In that sentence, then, you can see that the action that was done is in the past through did. So auxiliary verbs are really helpful because they can give a lot of information about um, the modality of what's happened or happening. Adjectives, these are words that describe nouns and you get evaluative adjectives. These express a judgment on something they're describing. For example, amazing, wonderful, ridiculous, beautiful, ugly, sensational. And you can see with evaluative adjectives, they evoke an emotion or thought in a person. Um, and so they help to, to cause the reader to form a judgment. So knowing this is really important because it can help you to make sure that you're conveying your ideas clearly and convincingly. Comparatives provide a comparison and they usually end in ER. However, if the adjective has two syllables, it will have more in front of it. So for example, bright can become brighter or light becomes lighter. Intelligent, on the other hand, has more than two syllables. Um, it has two or more syllables. And you know that because you can just do the clap. So intelligent, okay, whereas bright, you can hear the difference. So if you're not sure about the number of syllables, do the clapping test. So with intelligent, we would put more in front of it, more intelligent. Superlatives provide the most extreme of something. These usually end in EST. However, if the adjective has two syllables, it will have most in front of it. For example, brightest, lightest, most intelligent. And you can't get more than a superlative. So it's the highest form of degree. Um, adverbs, words that describe how something is done and they describe verbs. They usually end in ly, however, not all do. So you need to consider how the word is being used. Um, adverbs tell you when something happens, for example, yesterday, tomorrow, last year, how often, regularly, always, seldom, hardly, place or where, for example, nearby, downstairs, indoors, outside, manner, the way something is done, enthusiastically, quickly, immediately, solemnly, um, purpose, why something happened, the reason, therefore, since thus, the degree, considerably, immensely, hardly, Probability, unlikely, probably, surely. How much, fully, almost, and too. So too much of something. And then we have prepositions. These are linking words that are put before nouns and pronouns and describe something's location or other information. So it's really important that you understand this because many students will get um, prepositions wrong, particularly in, into, of, off, onto. So if you struggle with those or you routinely make a mistake, I would invite you to look these words up because while you might know the basic definition, it's important that you fully understand them so that in your writing, you're able to use them um, accurately. Pronouns are words that are used instead of a noun or noun phrase. So we've got personal pronouns, object pronouns, possessive pronouns, reflexive pronouns, and relative pronouns. Um, and again, it's really important that we understand them because some of them will have, as you can see, singular and plural. So it's really important that you understand this so that you use them correctly, okay? And this is really helpful so you know when to use which, whom, whomever, whose as well. Conjunctures are uninflected linguistic form that joins together sentences, clauses, phrases, or words. So in a nutshell, conjunctions are joining words, if you like. Um, we can have coordinating conjunctions, which link two sentences of equal grammatical value. For example, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. So those are when we have two sentences that are of equal value and we can join them together. Now, a comma is used when a coordinating conjunction is used to join two independent clauses. Correlative conjunctions are pairs of conjunctions, for example, either or, neither nor, but only, but also. So what that means is with correlative conjunctions, it's when we have to use both in order to join a sentence together. We then have subordinating conjunctions, and this is when we join an independent clause with a subordinate clause. And that means a clause that makes sense on its own and one that doesn't. So for example, we can, can link them um, with after, although, since, unless. No, a subordinating clause is a clause that does not make sense on its own, an independent clause is a clause that makes sense on its own. So if you don't remember that, please make sure that you make a note of them. And I would invite you to make sure that you go through this and maybe listen to it a few times to make sure that you've understood it. And then to do something with the information afterwards as well. So either do, a, do flashcards or a mind map just to help really 
make sure that you're not only understanding them, but memorizing it too, because as I said, this is really helpful for um, analyzing, but more importantly, for your writing too, so that you can proofread your sentences. Interjections are words used to express strong feelings or sudden emotion, usually used at the start of a sentence to express sentiments such as surprise, disgust, joy, excitement, or enthusiasm. Hey, oh, good, few, well, ha, if uh, you've read Shakespeare or poetry. So knowing word class is important because it helps you to analyze writers' choice of words and the impact they want to create on their readers. They enable you to write sentences with grammatical accuracy. So here are some strategies to identify the word class in sentences. We're going to use three. Now, it's important that you use a combination of these, these three strategies to make sure that you get the correct answer. So the first thing is we can look at the meaning of the word. The second is the form or shape of the word. And third is the position or context of the word in a sentence. So for example, the meaning of the word. So we generalize about the kind of meanings that words convey. For example, we could group together the words brother and car, as well as David, house and London on the basis that they all refer to people, places or things. In fact, that has traditionally been a popular approach to determining members of the class of nouns. It has also been applied to verbs by saying that they denote some kind of action like cook, drive, eat, run, shout, or walk. Using this strategy allows us to determine word classes by replacing words in a sentence with words of similar meaning. For instance, in the sentence, my nephew cooks dinner every Saturday, we can replace the verb cooks with other action words. My nephew prepares dinner every Saturday. My nephew eats dinner every Saturday. My nephew misses dinner every Saturday. So from doing this, we know that cooks, prepares, eats, and misses are all verbs. So on the basis of this replacement test, we can conclude that all of these words belong to the same class that have action words or verbs. Now, this is a really useful um, strategy, but it can also cause mistakes to occur. So for example, abstract nouns such as time, imagination, repetition, with some chance. Um, verbs like be, as in I want to be happy, what action does be referred to here. So it's not referring to an action, right? It's a state. And so relying solely on, on this strategy could cause errors to occur. So it is important to use because it can be really helpful, but there are limitations with it. And knowing that means that it will allow you to look at other strategies too, just to make sure that you're correct. So the second um, that we look at the second strategy to help us determine word class is the form or shape of a word. So you can figure out the word class of a word based on its form or shape. For instance, many nouns have a characteristic shun ending, action, condition, education, demonstration, gumption, repetition. Similarly, many adjectives end in able or able, acceptable, credible, miserable, responsible, suitable, terrible. And many words also take inflections. These are regular changes in their form under certain circumstances. For example, nouns can take a plural inflection usually by adding an S at the end. Car becomes cars, tables, a table becomes tables, and book becomes books. Verbs also take inflection. So for example, walk, walks, walked, and walking. So we can add S, E, D, or I, N, G. And knowing these inflections can help us determine um, the type of word being used. the position or context of a word in a sentence as a third strategy. So this refers to where words typically occur in a sentence and the kinds of words uh, which typically occur near to them. To illustrate how to use a strategy, compare the following. Jason cooks dinner every Sunday. The cook is away. So in the first sentence that we've got there, and let's go back to this. In the first sentence, um, cook is a verb, but in the second sentence, it is a noun. And we can see that cook is a noun in the second one because it can take the plural S inflection. The cooks are away, but we couldn't, and that's how we can tell that it is a noun. You can also apply replacement tests based on our first criteria, replacing cook in each sentence with similar words. For example, Jason prepares dinner every Sunday. The chef is away. So with Jason prepares dinner, we know that's a verb because prepares is a verb. And then the second one, we can replace the word cook with chef, which is a noun. Chef is a noun because it's telling us a profession. And so notice that we can replace verbs with verbs and nouns with nouns, but we cannot replace verbs with nouns or nouns with verbs. So I chef dinner every Sunday it does not make sense because chef is a noun. The eat is on holiday does not make sense because eat is a verb. 
So cook can be a verb or a noun. It depends on how the word is used. In fact, in English, many words can belong to more than one word class. She looks very pale as a verb, looks as a, as a verb. She's very proud of her looks. Looks here is referring to her physical appearance and as a noun. He drives a fast car. Fast is being used as an adjective. He drives very fast on the motorway. That is an adverb because um, um, fast is telling us how something is being done, how he is driving. Whereas in he drives a fast car, it's being used to describe his car. Does that make sense? So this third strategy is very useful in helping us to determine um, how words are, are used and in sentences and so helps us to identify the word class. And so I would recommend that you use a combination of all three strategies um, because it will help you to ensure that your writing is accurate and help you to understand the words in greater detail. So do make sure that you go back through this recording if you need to. Make sure that you do something with the information